Uh, okay. Uh, essentially, I'm gonna give a little, uh, uh, very short history of uh, Iran and its relationship in the international system, its relationship with the West, up until the uh, 1979, very quick one. And then uh, from there on, um, go through the, the breakdown of uh, essentially what is economic warfare, sanction, use of sanctions, use of uh, uh, embargoes uh, against the Iranian government, against the Ira uh, Iran. And uh, then open it up and I'm sure that uh, there are people who uh, have uh, uh, some input and just raise your hand and jump in. So um, basically Iran uh, was a very insulated because of Ottoman Empire. It was very insulated from the European uh, uh, continent. Um, essentially what happened before the Safavid, it was the, the Venetians that went there and they basically secured the first monopoly of trading silk. After that, that uh, after that, uh, um, the, it was the Portuguese that went into the Persian Gulf, and they actually um, set up uh, forts in the Strait of Hormuz, uh, which is now a subject of uh, uh, debate and uh, whether U.S. is going to control it or Iran is going to close it. It's now coming back up that area was controlled by the Portuguese and it was a Safavid basic essentially they didn't have a navy so they had to rely on the British in order to uh, put the uh, Portuguese out and British happily uh, being rising power uh, lend their navy to Iran and the Iranian uh, King, Saf uh, uh, King uh, Shah Abbas and essentially after that uh, the, the British were driven out because of the, the Turkish, there was a Turkish alliance. Uh, uh, there was an alliance between um, the Ottoman, it was a detente between the uh, Ottomans and the, the Safavid Persia. They would go to war and they would, kind of like the, the Soviet Union and the uh, United States, they would go to war and they would actually uh, uh, make peace and it was during the peace time that basically the British were uh, driven out they, uh, from Iran. And uh, this is about 300 years ago. Um, the last war that Iran engaged in, uh, which uh, was against India, and this is the time, essentially, the Mughal end of the Mughal Empire in India, and the British uh, became the winners of it because uh, the Iranians went in, they looted the Delhi, and they get and they got out, and uh, the Mughal Empire after that was so weakened that the British moved in. They eliminated and they began colonizing Britain uh, outright. Before that, it was just certain companies. Um, moving uh, closer to the Qajar area is essentially when the uh, great game began. The British controlled India. They wanted to protect India from the advancement of Russian uh, czars. So what they did was basically the car. They they had this policy of uh, creating this protective zone against the uh, Russians, so um, they started engaging um, the Iranian um, monarchy, the Qajars, uh, and they basically secured rights in the southern part, uh, which basically uh, entailed some economic rights, entailed uh, um, uh, uh, rights of flag, so the Iranian citizens, subjects of the king, who had the British flag in the southern zone, would not be subject to the scrutiny by the government. So, um, and uh, from then on, uh, this is when um, the uh, certain interests, the local interests, business interests, had to rely, began relying on the religious figures uh, to rally the people against this monopoly practices. One of the examples is basically one of the Qajar kings, in order to the, um, finance his trip to Europe, uh, they gave the rights uh, of monopoly of trading of tobacco. So growth, sales and export of uh, tobacco 
would be controlled by the Britain under this monopoly, uh, under this uh, special concession given to the British. And what happened was uh, the uh, local interest essentially went to the uh, uh, one of the. Um, religious figures his name is Mirza Reza Shirazi and uh, he essentially declared a fatwa that the use of tobacco is haram until this is repealed so use of this uh, use of tobacco is forbidden religiously it's a sin until this monopoly is in power so this is the, one of the uh, instances of um, progressive what, what I call progressive use of religion in order to uh, stand against what I call imperialism, imperialist practice, uh, monopolizing practice. And uh, it was during this time that basically, it was after this time that the, the oh, one more thing, uh, the religious, uh, the religious versus non-religious education system is essentially what was introduced much later on. Before, at this time, only um, educational uh, possibility for the upper class uh, of the Iran was going to what is called Hose, which is a madrasa, or like uh, essentially is like. You go there to read, write, uh, learn how to read and write, do mathematics, do philosophy, but it's essentially organized um, in a, uh, along the lines of religious. Um, religion is a big part of it. So then the people who become um, clergymen and go through this system. Before this, there was there was no secular religion, uh, secular education system. So. Um, and what happens is like, uh, like these guys uh, uh, operated much like lawyers do. So in uh, business disputes, uh, they would go to the um, uh, clergyman of the uh, bazaar and they would settle the, uh, the, uh, the, the dispute between businessmen. And that's how they made most of their money. Like basically you hire, uh, just like you hire a lawyer, they hire the clergyman to do their business. They don't hire them; they just pay them to resolve the conflict. It's like um, so. The, it's the constitutional revolution, which um, uh, another thing. Uh, major, imp, major uh, intellectual uh, routes to Iran uh, were Balk the Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and uh, Georgia. That was the major. Uh, 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 way that Iranians began to know about uh, like for example socialism, Marxism and all this what came to Iran from Russia and uh, it was basically Iranian um, migrant workers going to that uh, caucus area uh, to work and they basically got organized. It's actually the, the Russian Social Democratic Party which produced Kerensky was a major organizing factor in caucuses. They were, had a major force over there. Um, and then there was uh, Cairo and Istanbul, which also uh, uh, kept some of the, the religious uh, debate between the Sunni and Shiites. They had it going uh, between uh, these two. Like a lot of oppositional newspapers at the time of Constitu Constitutional Revolution, which is 1907, were printed uh, clandestinely in those uh, uh, cities and brought illegally to Iran. And the Constitutional Revolution is essentially, um, it was an uprising based on, uh, that wanted to uh, impose a constitution on Iran. It's the, the movement that produced the parliamentary the system of Iran, the parliament, which is called Majlis. And uh, at the beginning, uh, the king at the time was backed by the Russians. He was very close to uh, the Russian czars. So, uh, he uh, he put down the first man's list and uh, he executed major leaders of it and he drove off and uh, he was driven out uh, by the, the uprising that uh, basically reinstated majlis but during this uprising there was a um, 
there was a okay there was two tendencies within this movement that threw off the you know, the king and uh, basically re-established the majlis one was that uh, more uh, european minded they which wanted to basically import uh, like imported uh, the belgian style constitution belgium was very uh, much the model uh, at the time like belgian constitution was the model that one, they wanted to do uh, in Iran, also in Egypt, they wanted to do some, the Young Torch wanted to do it in Ottoman Empire. So uh, that was one tendency. And the other tendency was the tendency which is basically they wanted to have a Mashrute, uh, which is uh, religious conditionality. Mashrute means uh, conditionality. And basically they wanted to mix, it's the beginning of the um, religious modernity of Iran which basically wanted to say no we don't want to get rid of the uh, uh, religion uh, influences in the politics and it's obviously uh, was uh, supported by the business elite in the bazaar who were afraid of this westernization this new model of uh, importing stuff from the west okay let me know if I'm talking yes this is 1907, this is the Constitutional Revolution. And uh, from then on, essentially uh, reflecting the, the, uh, uh, the great power, uh, the great struggle between the Russians and the uh, English, two camps developed and two oppositional camps in each side of it. So in the north you have this uh, uh, monopoly by the Russians on uh, like for example porting, fishing in Caspian Sea, uh, oil drilling and the opposition to that was uh, connected to the opposition within Russia and in the south you have the reverse of it, you have this uh, religious opposition to the British imperialism and from there on um, you, you see this, this um, disconnect between the northern part of Iran and the southern part of Iran and this is the time and that um, the British and the Russians divide Iran in half and they any if the Shah of Iran if the king wanted to go to the south he had to get permission from the um, local power and uh, from and um, at the end of Qajar but essentially Qajars were very weak they had the last king was a child so he couldn't uh, put down the turmoil, what is called turmoil, which is essentially the local people uprising against the central government. You have the law uprising, you have the uh, communist uprising, which is actually mentioned by uh, Rosa Luxemburg in her uh, newspaper, um, Mirza Kuchak Khan. Uh, it was a northern uprising in support of the, the Bolshevik revolution, very much connected to uh, the Bolsheviks, and they got the very, they got help from uh, uh, they got advisors from the Russian uh, the Bolshevik uh, party and what happened was like uh, the British um, helped the first king of Pahlavi which is the last dynasty they essentially organized the coup they put him in contact uh, with the other contacts they had like his name is Reza Khan Reza Shah uh, for the people who support the monarchy Reza Shah and he essentially came to power by a military invasion of Tehran put the last king of Qajars out of uh, business let's say and uh, he declared himself to be the king and uh, for a lot of Iranians this is 1921 1920 to 1921 and uh, what essentially Reza Shah is seen by a lot of, uh, uh, by some Iranians as a modernizer. He's the person who basically brought in the state model into Iran. Before then, Iran was, a, was operated on millet system, which is it's also operated in Ottoman Empire, which basically is local rulers uh, who basically exploit the uh, local population and whatever they take some and then they um, they send a surplus or like the money made to the king so Iran was funded very much like that no taxation as in as we understand it currently so Reza Shah is basically the guy who built the modern army of Iran and he used it very efficiently to put down the revolts against him 
uh, he introduced uh, introduced uh, he modernized the post system he introduced the university system the western style of uni uh, education into iran but at the same time he was the per he did not he is the person who actually uh, removed the veil forceful removal of veils in iran happened under him he basically sent uh, police and any woman that was wearing veil uh, they forcibly remove the veil from them in public which is uh, for some people they see it as liberation of women but at the same time it's forceful let's not forget that it was against the will of the people and it was uh, enforced very brutally uh, he's the person who uh, basically uh, uh, wanted to play a, uh, wanted to make Iran um, okay he wanted to make Iran clo uh, follow the path of uh, the Turkish model uh, the uh, Mustafa Kemal at the Turks model at the Turks model and he basically he was very forceful in that and uh, at the end of his uh, dynasty he, this is World War two beginning of like leading up to the World War two he was trying to uh, distance himself from the British and what he did essentially is like he began relying on the uh, German advisors. Uh, so the Germans move in, British get really um, naturally, you know, they get really worried that uh, there's Nazi advisors uh, in Iran. There is uh, Iran, there is a pan Iranist movement, which is basically it's a fascist movement uh, that uh, comes out of it. And uh, the British. Uh, invade Iran from the south, the Russian Red Army from the north. They remove him, they put his son, which is very young. He grew up in Switzerland most of his life. He, edu he was educated over there. He was a very weak figure because his, the father was a very strong man, a very strong uh, um, figure, and by contrast, his son was much weaker. And they put him in power, they uh, ship off the uh, Reza Khan to uh, uh, exile. And it is during this time, because there is a weak king, there is two opposite polar ideological uh, poles in the country that you see the beginning of a very vibrant uh, dialogue, very vibrant uh, contestation for power and popular support. You have the Tudeh party, which is a communist party of Iran, uh, formed initially very independent of the Soviet Union. Uh, it, it is basically during this time that is being uh, they officially engaged the the, um, the oil workers in the south. And oh yes, I forgot this. Um, the oil concessions, the oil concessions of 1919, and um, uh, basically gives the, the British the right to develop Iranian oil in, in partnership with the um, Iranian government on uh, 400 years on 75 to 25 percent 75 to British uh, Anglo uh, Persian uh, oil uh, company and 25 percent to Iranian government but at the same time Iranian government is responsible for paying the for building it too so that 25 percent is further cut um, it is uh, that's passed under Reza Shah in 19, uh, that's uh, 1919, uh, 1919 actually, and uh, Reza Shah keeps that in power, uh, keeps that in effect. Uh, so we move to the post World War II uh, um, time. The Americans are also uh, deploy some troops over there. Um, the the young king Mohammad Reza Shah, which is the last king, I just call him the Shah from now on because that is what the Americans refer to him. He's not the only Shah of Iran; he's the last one. But uh, in a, seeing that the British are going, they're getting weaker uh, and being very much afraid of the USSR and its influence in Iran. Um, Shah decides to become closer and closer to the Americans. So, as a favor, for example, he buys all the American equipment after World War II, all the army surplus stuff, basically. And that's just one example. And uh, he begins in sending uh, uh, the uh, Iranian students instead, instead of France and England to United States. So, this is the beginning of uh, um, development of Iranian-American uh, relationship. And up until now, 
the, the view of the United States in Iran is very positive. There was a, it's seen as an anti-imperialist country, anti-colonial country because US wanted to get involved in the colonial game. So it basically put down the British, French, Portuguese. They, it did not support their colonial movements outright. At the same time, um, uh, there was an incident, which is a short uh, Schuster in incident, which goes back way back. Uh, which uh, Iranian government hires an American guy to do audit, and they basically audit uh, the people very close to the uh, British and the Russians. And uh, through their for through their uh, pressure, he gets out, and he becomes kind of a Iranian uh, Iranian uh, friendly hero figure in Iran. His name is Shoster. He was uh, auditing. He was audited. His name is Morgan Shoster, and uh, he was basically auditing. He became a head of treasury in Iran, and he was auditing the accounts of the people who were not paying taxes. And these people were um, basically close to America, uh, British, and uh, Russians. So he was pushed out. Um, so we come to 1950s, and there is a. In part because uh, following the other developments in the third world, um, Iranians t begin talk about nationalizing the oil. And at first, they want to nationalize oil on 50-50 level. This is uh, Mossadegh's initial plan was 50-50. British refused it outright. And uh, at the same time, you have the Tudor party, which at, uh, at this time is very popular because they developed. Uh, um, kind of workers bill of rights which introduced that uh, Friday day off eight day work week uh, which is very revolutionary at the, uh, for the Middle East and there, there is no worker uh, friendly movement up until uh, this point in Middle East so um, today it becomes very close to the Russians and they basically become um, a lobbying force for the Russians to get the right to develop oil fields in the north Mossadegh refuses that outright so this is, you hear sometimes that Mossadegh would, uh, was communist friendly. Mossadegh was very weary of the uh, uh, Bolshevik, uh, the uh, USSR. And uh, essentially as a rebuttal, he says to the, the uh, Russians that, you know, uh, uh, we had a very good view of the USSR because of the Lenin's uh, uh, exposure of the secret treaties. But at the same time, we are not. But at the same time, we are not going to the, the give the rights to the Russian oil fields, uh, to the Russia uh, to develop the northern oil fields. In 1953, most of it's common knowledge now. But 1953, essentially, the British, uh, through their contacts uh, in the bazaar and uh, in the religious institution, um, uh, as a person, his his name is Kashani. Yeah, they um, instigate a coup, and the Americans essentially use uh, another contact religious man. His name is uh, Behbahani, and they use these two against Mossadegh, which initially they were in the same league with, uh, to overthrow this guy through the use like paying thugs uh, in the streets to basically go and break windows in the name of Communist Party and. Uh, uh, shout slogans of the Tudor, uh, the Tudor party and uh, basically they they manufacture they, they, they put on a show that the communists are taking over and Mossadegh is supporting them which essentially was a show financed by the, the American dollars and British pound and at this point is the time that we have a secret police um, uh, which uh, his name is Savak and um, the guy, the, the model is basically developed by the CIA and uh, helped along later on by Mossad, which Iran developed a uh, relationship with, but unspoken relationship, uh, Iran would sell oil to Israel, Iran would basically ha uh, in, in white Israeli uh, uh, military officers without actually recognizing the country. So this is another uh, thing that was uh, built in uh, to the resentment that led up to the revolution. Um, so now we, I'm jumping over uh, like 
uh, 10 years into 70s. Early 70s is basically uh, what uh, the opposition to the Shah started in 72, 73 that came out right in the open. You have the Iranian college student outside Iran, um, basically the organizing in various Marxist or Islamist um, factions. You have uh, a guy named Shariati, which is an intellectual who studied with Jean Paul Sartre and uh, Franz Fanon, and he brought in that strain of uh, national liberation into Iranian politics. You have the leftist, obviously, as always, the anti authoritarian uh, movement. Uh, which basically resulted into uh, two factions, one being Mujahideen um, Khalq um, Iran, MKO, which started as an anti-Shah uh, movement uh, with a uh, lot of influences from Shariati. And you have Fadayan Khalq, which basically uh, became, they were Maoist group. And these guys organized outside Iran and inside Iran, but and the Fadayan are actually the ones who made an insurrection that was crushed. But it was the insurrection that uh, basically the whole army was deployed into that area, which is named Siahgal. And that, this is 73. And this is basically, they tried to take over a, a, a gendarme, a sheriff some similar a police yeah, station a rural police force they tried to take it over and actually they had a um, back and forth they had a war and uh, a lot of people it, it, it uh, made an impact on the consciousness of, of the people that we can stand up even though it was crushed and all these leaders who were rounded up uh, were shot on the hills you know no um, try and uh, from here on you have you see the development uh, of the like there is a modern islamist move modern islamic oriented uh, movement which basically used the mosque networks to disseminate propaganda against the shah and uh, comes to 1970 in uh, 1979 you the you have major uh, demonstration against shah uh, because of the shah gives out uh, this Mm. Similar to what British got in the colonial times, uh, protection of their personnel inside Iran, Shah gives out, uh, gives out this uh, um, capitulation, essentially, capitulation, which basically any American uh, soldier committing any crime would not be tried in Iranian courts and would be uh, tried in American court. And this was basically uh, brought up by Ayatollah Khomeini. This is his first, this is what makes him a major figure. He stands up uh, while other clergymen um, are silent. He stands up and essentially says, okay, this is a colonialism and he uses a lot of words that are uh, familiar to the leftists and the Islamists. So he, this is colonialism, this is imperialism. And uh, so mm, there's a famous quote that says, if American uh, soldier, um, if, if, if the Iranian king runs over American soldier's dog, he needs to be tried in American uh, courts. And uh, this, it, it, br it brings out the disparity of power that Shah was willing to submit to. And um, there's a major demonstration in early 79 that basically results in uh, like a massacre, which is, it is called massacre. It's very, it's, and it's not known how many people died. Uh, Franz, uh, sorry, Michel Foucault puts it to, into thousands, but that's exaggeration, obviously. 1962. 1962? Yeah, the first, the first uprising. Would you? Okay. Can you speak about it? Well, you know, you're right, but it was in 1979 that, that started. That was 1979, but That's the first uprising of Khomeini was 1962 that Shah put down and exiled him, right? Well, he, that was an uprising. He made a speech and essentially, he made a speech and he was put under house arrest and uh, yeah, and after I that was exiled. Seeing killing in the streets, 15,000 people. 15,000 people, yes. okay. <laughs> that was the reason Khomeini became so famous. Okay. Because he stood up and, and 
the Shah wanted to kill him, actually. Uh, but they decided not to because other Grand Ayatollahs elevated him to Grand Ayatollah and he couldn't kill him because he was Grand Ayatollah. So he was exiled to Iraq. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, don't. No, I'm just trying to. No, I, the, the one that the I was. Are important. <laughs> the, the one, the, the one that I was referring to was actually the Jaled, oh, Maiden that Jaled. The last that's that's the revolution that '79. Right. That's what I was referring to. Then that Mich, that's the one I'm saying. That's Michel Foucault was re right. successful. That one. was a successful one. Right. Successful one, I say. Uh, Okay, the 1970. This is 1979, which basically the, the starts uh, the the. It it basically um, snowballs into uh, the, the overthrow of the Shah, and in the overthrow of the Shah, it's very important. A lot of people view it as a purely Islamic, uh, Islamist-oriented, Islamist-developed uh, affair, which is actually. What is later? Uh, what has? Uh, it is propaganda of the after pro uh, the Islamic Republic, which does not include a uh, lot of factions. The liberals were involved, and the leftists were involved, and then there was this um, there was this international influence of it. From the uh, Khomeini was exiled in '62 to Iraq. And then uh, he was there until s he was in exile in Turkey. And then six months before the 79 revolution was successful at the, in February of 79, uh, six months before that he went, he goes to France. And you have all these uprisings, upheavals that are grabbing the, the Western audience's attention, and they're trying to figure out what it is. And he goes to France, where all the cameras go to, and he becomes the central figure of this development, this uh, latest development. Uh, in inter minds of international community, he becomes the leader. But we have to know that just like any, uh, uh, like, just like any society, um, any movement, there is no one central figure in opposition. So y you have a lot of people like uh, the Bazargan, which try to use his uh, um, international fame in order to bring down the government and uh, and essentially they would become and uh, they would uh, they hoped that they would become the central fed they would build a western style parliamentary republic and uh, so you have this uh, meeting in uh, in in France in Nofela Chateau of uh, various figures of the opposition movement with the exclusion of the leftists, liberals, nationalists, uh, and the Islamists essentially coalesce over there and they, they put down this uh, unstoppable um, front against the Shah to the exclusion of, I say again, the leftists. And uh, from then on, the Shah leaves. There's a, Guadal uh, there's a conference in Guadalupe, uh, which basically the Western powers declare that, okay, Shah does not have the capacity to control this, we're not going to support him anymore, and he leaves. Yes. Um, why did they exclude the leftists? Why do the liberals and the nationalists always exclude the leftists? That is a good question. <laughs> yeah, because of the private property. I mean, the, the, the <laughs> Fadayan, I mean, like, we can get into that in another discussion, but uh, that's always uh, the case. But um, after, uh, okay, Khomeini comes. Yes. Uh, maybe this is the other discussion, and you don't want to be interrupted, but I have a question about uh, the, the role of uh, the various classes within Iran itself uh, during the period of 1979, and in particular, uh, whether there were any independent organizations of the Iranian working class, for example, among the oil workers. Uh, and also, uh, what were the any play, were they still a significant force in 1979? Tude was, uh, okay, various, okay, there were, just like anywhere else, there's so many different leftist organizations, and they uh, splinter from each other. Uh, like you have the, the um, 
the Tuda was the oldest one, but by that time, because essentially because of the, the, the uh, relationship that they had with Soviet Union and it came into the open, they were not uh, really trusted by the public. They were not. They, we had the, um, the Maoist group that I talk about, Fadayan. Uh, they are very small, but they're very inactive. And you have the uh, you have the the, the, the Mujahideen Khalq, which is essentially a national liberation uh, uh, organization, uh, which basically at this time they were anti-authoritarian and they were open and they were very organized, and uh, and at this time still they were uh, trusted by the people. They had a significant portion of trust by the. Um, upper middle class uh, educated uh, class you know the, the people who have some opportunities but at the same time they're, oppo in, they're in opposition to the Shah and you have uh, like Tufan, Paycar and all these are very small organizations they're not really significant force but at the same time Fadayan and the Mujahideen they were the two ones Fadayan after the, the um, Okay, the Tuda um, recognizes that they want to get into a, a coalition with the Islamists after the uh, election. So what ha after the election, after the um, revolution, after Shah leaves and Khomeini comes into power. So you have this split between the f in within the Fadayan movement, which is basically uh, majority goes with the Tuda and supports them. The minority goes in Kurdistan and starts fighting. The, the, the what the organ the armed wing of the, the Islamist movement, which becomes a revolutionary guard, passed on, and uh, so. I, I don't mean to dominate, but I'm wondering. I mean, you're, it's interesting what you're saying on from the top, but what's happening at the bottom? You have the oil workers. Uh, yeah, you have oil workers striking, but at the same time, this strike. Uh, it's a working class strike, but the, the, I, it was not called, like the call for that strike came from the Islamist camp. It did not come from the leftist camp. So it, it's an industrial action, but in industrial action based on religious ideology, not the political ideology, not the working class oriented ideology. It's not about taking over the, the means of production is about shutting down the, the economy. You understand, you know? So, for example, there were not workers' councils created. The workers' so councils? Like, they, I don't know, I'm not. There were committees, like, there is this idea, like, committee. Uh, there was committees in, created, but again, it was committees oriented towards the, uh, the, is, the committees were dominated by Islamist figures. Especially after, and they become kind of like a neighborhood security force at the beginning. They were neighborhood security force, and this is because essentially there is a war going on, like urban warfare going on between the MKO, Mujahideen and Khalq, and the, the, the religious um, oriented movement. So there is actually, which is actually very interesting because the MKO, the, they lose that war essentially, and they're driven out, but they. Uh, the, the leadership uh, okay I give a little history of the uh, MKO MKO started as an uh, like uh, anti Shah movement but there is a figure in within the movement his name is Masood Rajavi nobody knows if he's alive or dead and uh, he basically while he's in jail he rats out on his uh, uh, the, the, the top committee the executive committee and what happens is like he turns them over to Savak, so they end up dead, and he becomes the major figure. After the revolution, he's uh, free. The political prisoners are free. He comes out, he's the major figure, and uh, he's the one after that which is basically uh, driving the organization and directing the organization. Mujahideen al during the war with Iraq, they move to Iraq, and they, start, they basically uh, operate as the fifth column for the Iraqis. They do the interrogations, they do the, uh, they become plants in the um, uh, POW camps. And the people from MKO? MKO, yeah. And uh, so, and after, obviously after the, like, 
when Saddam invades uh, Kuwait and he's uh, he's really weakened, they are they have a they had a the, they still have it I think um, they have a camp over there Camp Ashraf, which is basically Saddam. It was said Saddam is just holding on to them in order to have a negotiation chip with the Iranians, and Iranians had supported some Iraqi group which became uh, Sadr came out of it after the U.S. invaded and anyways so and, um, after Saddam becomes weaker these guys move to France and uh, okay their leadership is in France they concentrate on lobbying the Western governments against Iran they are the one who actually break the news which is not really the news for Iranian we always knew that the nuclear reactor in Boucher was going to be built and worked on but they basically bring it up make it an issue uh, that okay Iran is having a nuclear uh, um, uh, program and uh, what happens like they become very much uh, the, the lobbying they become uh, a lobbying group in United States they donate like in terms of, like they donated in 1999 to the Republican campaigns in New York and the Democratic campaign in New York one thousand uh, dollars increments but thirty thousand to each candidate in the Manhattan area so um, and they're actually the ones that uh, uh, they get some help from Israel, they get help from Israel, they get uh, anything that goes against Iranian, current Iranian government, they, they love it. But, uh, mm, okay, I, uh, go for it. Answer, you know, well, you were asking about where they were um, uh, leftists organized at the time of the revolution. Especially at right, the right. I want to address that directly. Uh, I was among a lot of them, so I have some percent knowledge. Uh, they were all from Fatsias to outright communists to the party to Fadayan, even Marxist, MPO portion that became Marxist. They were all uh, uh, coalescing around Romania's revolution with the thought that these fanatical uh, mullahs cannot run the country. We will take over later. Okay? So they were all supporting him. They were all supporting the overthrow of the job because they were anti-imperialist West and so forth. And and for many uh, ignorant and let them believe that's you know I mean, open democracy, they have a chance to participate. But after he succeeded in the revolution and he uh, strengthened his position, he wiped them all. The bottom line. <laughs> okay. The Again, from personal uh, family experience, not all of them supported Khomeini. Well, of course. And they, there was they, a lot of people who left it. They, 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 they did not know. There, there were people who actually put, took a position. I, mean, I don't know if you know Bijan Jazani. He yes. very early on he wrote that okay, the the the, the mass base of Iran, Iranian working class, the third level that Westerners don't see, are organizing against uh, organizing around the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, and he encouraged all his comrades to uh, take a stand and educate people on it there is a lot of uh, leftists that are outside Iran that you can talk to and the reason they're outside Iran is because of the fact that they are, they left no doubt about but, it, but I'm, what I'm saying was their tactical decision to get rid of the Shah using Khomeini's movement because they weren't some of the groups did that yes right. and then they had the op uh, option of you know uh, Exerting their own influence in a uh, so called democratic environment. Okay. okay. Just trying to just sum up what you went for. Okay. okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, from here on out, uh, 79, uh, like. I want to bring in the international, like American involvement with, uh, like, Ingrid. Yes. How long was the conflict? Like after the Shah was deposed, like what in this internal struggle? Like how long did that take? And was there a power vacuum? Or? There was uh, okay. The, um, there was a. Uh, it's hard to put a date on. Uh, I would personally say it after the Shah left, uh, maybe a year, year and a half. That was this uh, back and forth, but. Uh, that is that Khomeini's front was by far the prevailing front, you know. Uh, it seems uh, okay. Um, that the battle was between Khomeini and 
the coalition? No, it was like it's essentially is that some some can you can say it's kind of a comedy of error on the part of the liberals and leftists because they basically uh, the leftists were not strong. The uh, liberals essentially uh, they wanted to use this figure, but they didn't want to give power to him, obviously. But at the same time, they were af more afraid of the left than afraid of the uh, religious front. So you have this. Uh, Okay, 79 um, revolution in February. You know, basically, there's, there's a Islamic, there's a uh, Shah is deposed and uh, he's gone. And uh, the leftists want to basically Fadayan. Essentially, they Shah was exiled in the U.S. Right? Shah was flying around because nobody wanted him. They, he came uh, to U.S. for surgery. Uh, and uh, when that happened, when he came to the uh, U.S., that's when the hostage crisis happened. The and rest of his I get it. Came. Like, the rest of his family yeah. has been easily. Yeah, person. yeah. But the major, the figure himself came here and talked about. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the, the beginning of the hostage crisis right now. Like, the hostage crisis was essentially a leftist idea. The Fadayan basically stormed the U.S. embassy. They took it in June of uh, '79. But basically, what happened was that uh, we have this guy uh, Mansur Farhang. He's the, the interim. Uh, uh, Foreign uh, International Affairs, the Vizier uh, the, the he Minister of uh, Foreign Relations, but the interim one, and he goes over there. He says, "Okay, this is not good. Uh, you need to the, like pick up and leave." And the, the leftists uh, essentially agree, and they leave that uh, the occupation of the, the U.S. Embassy. At that point, the Islamist. Uh, become in charge of the security of U.S. Embassy. This is very important because the Islamists later on uh, in uh, November, they, t uh, they staged the actual uh, hostage crisis that we know about is that one. But before this, they were in charge of the security of the embassy. So they know the, how to get in and how, uh, what to do and the personnel. And, when the when Shah comes to the the, the, the United States, the, this happens, and a lot of people. And this is when um, Carter basically imposes the. the it's actually November 14, 1979. The, they he he blocks uh, travel, and uh, he basically freezes the asset of Iran. But this is enabled uh, by 1977 International Emergency Economic Powers Act, which is uh, basically comes out of the American fear of a major international um, uh, economic uh, situation affecting its policy. And this is because of OPEC oil crisis. OPEC oil crisis was really the, the, uh, the thing that at the time captured the, the imagination of the American policymakers. So because of that, in 1977, um, they, uh, they passed this inter uh, International Emergen Emergency Economic Powers Act. And basically, it allows the President of the United States to freeze the assets of any country. So you have this uh, from here on in 1979, you have series of uh, bipartisan um, executive orders. You have the executive order in um, November 14, 1979. You, uh, basically, in, uh, executive order of uh, April 7 and 17th of 1980 done by uh, Ronald Reagan, which basically bans commerce and travel to Iran. Uh, you have the executive order of January 13, 1984 which basically designates Iran as a country supporting of terrorism. You have executive, these are all executive orders by Reagan now. Executive order uh, October 29, 1987, no goods of Iranian origin imported to U.S. So basically uh, no, uh, cutting the trade off. And then you have uh, this executive orders go all the way up to today, right now you have the sanctions on uh, a central bank. So I'm just going to read off the most of 1993. You have the Iran-Iraq Arms Proliferation Act, which basically uh, stops any, um, it, based on American, uh, based on American um, policy, they want to limit the pro pro proliferation of arms. Uh, to Iraq and Iran. 
But at the same time, uh, you have to uh, remember this is the Clinton time. This is a time that basically the so uh, Soviet Union is gone. They try to uh, limit the number of uh, the military capability of the opposing country. It always starts from the military and goes to economics and uh, like. Um, you have in 1995 ban on Americans entering into contracts with Iranian government on the energy sector, and uh, and uh, during that this is the time that basically um, during the Bush senior years actually they uh, they wanted to open the energy sector of Iran. You have the uh, Conoco which bid for one of the uh, development of a gas field in the, the Persian Gulf, which American, uh, which Clinton administration basically uh, forbid them to do that through doing this executive order. And uh, that contract was taken over by the French Total. And uh, in 1996, uh, Clinton signs the uh, Iran-Libya Sanction Act, which basically caps the, the involvement of uh, American companies to 40 million dollars in uh, which is nothing in the energy sector like 40 million dollars in energy is nothing in 1996 uh, you have this incident in the Khobar in Saudi Arabia which basically there's an explosion which we now know it was done by Al Qaeda but at that time it was uh, blamed on Iran. They said that, okay, this is Iranian uh, because Iran doesn't want the U.S. to be there. So it must have been Iran that uh, did this. Yes. Who is Al-Qaeda? Al huh? The, the group that you said that? Al-Qaeda. Uh, Al-Qaeda. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Saudi Arabia always covers up. <laughs> and... Because uh, they're involved with them. <laughs> so... Th and then uh, 1998, so you have the... the, the Okay, going back to Iran now. Uh, not the relationship between Iran and U.S. Now it's, it's uh, 79 again in Iran, uh, in 80 in Iran, and uh, there's a war. Uh, Saddam Hussein declares that uh, makes a declaration that Iran is occupying Arab land. What is uh, to him Arab land, which is actually what he means is the oil-producing region, Khuzestan, and he declares that uh, there is a three island that Iran. Uh, um, has a dispute over with UAE. These need to be traded off to the, the given back to the um, UAE. And he makes this declaration on a pan-Arabist uh, front. Basically, he's standing up. He wants to be the Arab man. And um, basically, the, there is invasion. And actually, the interesting thing is that the the Arab minority, the Shiite, the Shiites in the southern um, uh, the Khuzestan. It, there is a significant minority of Arab Shiites in Iran, in Khuzestan. They are the ones who initially resist the Ba'ath army, the Iraqi army, from coming in. And like uh, one of the cities, Khuram Shahr, which is right next to the Iraqi border, they basically do the street, urban warfare against the armed, uh, um, very well armed Iraqi army. And at this time, Iraq is backed by Soviet Union, and Iran is not obviously backed by U.S. anymore because they did a revolution and they invaded the embassy, so they can't get arms there from them anymore. And but you have this religious, you have this uh, religious inspired um, uh, movement of the people to go to the front and fight. And that initially, that's what keeps the, the Iraqi army from actually coming in and actually doing what Saddam wanted to do. I've been to the region and you, you see like, uh, you still see uh, the, the Iraqi graffitis that uh, we came here to stay. Like, uh, that was, um, and at this point, uh, okay. Um, the factions within the Iranian um, government uh, all unite, uh, Iranian government I have to say this, the Islamic Republican Party was dissolved after the, um, after there was uh, the complete takeover. So you have no parties anymore, so you have factions, you have fronts. So still in Iran you don't have a party, you have coalitions, you have a uh, uh, societies like you have society of Islamic engineers who become like Ahmadinejad comes out of that and uh, so you have this uh, uh, frontal politics and one of the major figures in Iranian politics at this time is the uh, is uh, Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani and this man is the Iranian capitalist he's the man who drives who is the beneficiary at, mm, of the um, 
this uh, weapons ban on Iran. This man is essentially the guy who the, uh, is the contact in the Iran Contra affair. So the, uh, Iran really needs uh, weapons. Um, Reagan really needs uh, training, like Reagan needs funding for uh, Contras. So this uh, interest, this mold, mold, conflicting, yes. What were the Contras? The Nicaragua. Yeah. They were basically uh, Contras where the... the and, and why did Reagan need money for it? Because he needed to, the, okay, uh, there was a ban on supporting the Contras that US Congress passed. And uh, they passed it actually twice. They passed two acts of not funding the Contras and Reagan still wanted to do it. And so um, uh, against uh, this fear mongering against communism coming from Central America and landing on Rio Grande, uh, basically Sandinistas were uh, anti, uh, they were a freedom, uh, freedom, move, freedom movement essentially. They wanted to run their own country. As Noam Chomsky says, you know, how dare they want to run their own country. And so they had this contrast that they had to go against the uh, get funding which US Congress doesn't uh, was not funding so what happened was like uh, Akbar Hashim Rafsanjani basically need, uh, was the contact person on the Iranian side to get the weapons uh, and actually what he did is uh, with the Iranian money he bought it but at the same time he sold it at a profit to Iran so that's what I mean but he's the Iranian capitalist Islamic capitalist so the and uh, where were we? 1990, uh, 1989, the war ends. Uh, you have a major uh, move to rebuild the economy. And uh, by this time, basically, um, the solidarity that is required, that is created during the times of crisis, is evaporated. Uh, this Iran, this weapons deal comes out, and that's a major shock to a lot of uh, people. And uh, so this is the beginning of the uh, government, the institutional losing of legitimacy inside Iran. And you have the rise of the, the like opposition movement, who's essentially not clear. Okay. And uh, 1998. Anybody wants to say something? I want to take a break. Okay. Uh, I would ask about the oil deal. You talked about the oil deal that happened. Oh well, the nationalization of oil took care of that. Like the Iran, uh, Mossadegh was uh, basically uh, nationalized the oil, and that was the reason he was overthrown. But at the same time, the new the company, the Iranian oil company, uh, still basically operates um, with foreign investment. Iran doesn't have a capacity to build its own uh, oil production facilities and st still to this day we are importing more oil. A lot of people say like what, why Iran needs uh, the nuclear reactor, nuclear energy, they have oil. But uh, most of them don't know that the development of energy sector uh, is incomplete inside Iran, uneven development within the uh, capitalist system. and. Uh, you have this, like, Iran imports 40% of its gas, like, which it uses to run uh, the country, basically. So, um, that's another thing, yes. I just want to add, uh, uh, Sorry, you're, you're getting lost. Oh, that the anglo iranian oil company subsequently became British Petroleum, which BP. is the company that had the big spill in the Gulf last year. The BP, yeah. So, we don't have to feel sorry. We don't. Okay, uh, uh, beginning of the sort of a rapprochement for two years, uh, it's 1998 and you have this uh, the major, what is called reformist figure, liberal figure, liberal Islamist figure, Khatami, he gets elected by 70%, nobody gave him a chance, like they said that uh, his opponent is going to uh, basically win and he wins with 70% support and uh, you have the beginning of uh, an openness in Iranian society. You have a lot of books that are basically banned, become very popular. You have uh, newspapers that uh, later on they get shut down, but you have this two-year opening of the system and uh, so basically this is the time that uh, 
Iran tries to come closer to U.S. There's kind of this uh, athlete diplomacy. They're like Iran, uh, U.S. sends a wrestling team to Iran for the first time, and you have them getting very warm welcome, and that is like beginning of something some people think and but at the same time you have uh, increased funding for the radio free uh, europe and radio liberty which basically u.s steps up its funding for the propaganda radios it uses against the government so you have this carrot and stick thing going on still and uh at this this time because at this this time that the the like it's 1995, which basically APAC really wants to uh, prevent any reproach, a real opening of relations between U.S. and uh, Iran. Um, APAC, the, the American-Israeli Public uh, uh, Affairs Council, and um, they hatched on to this idea. Like Khatami essentially says, if the Palestinians can uh, if if a reach if if a deal is reached between the Palestinian and Israeli that is favorable towards Palestinians, we have no problem with that. Which essentially says Israel needs to figure out its uh, uh, problem with Palestinians in order for us to back off. Essentially, but uh, you have this uh, openness also. Um, exhibited in the 2000 year, the year 2000 being declared the year of dialogue between civilization, which is ironically uh, uh, um, uh, um, put forth in the United Nations by Iran and uh, uh, United States, but it has not, it wasn't taken on. Like it was very limited, and it was limited to students' exchanges being legalized. Uh, tourism being legalized. Before this, U.S. has the the same uh, approach to Iran as it does to Cuba. Basically, you can't go to Cuba directly. Like they, you don't, uh, you're not allowed. And uh, this is the time that basically Iranians were expecting that their frozen asset from 1979 would be uh, unfrozen and would be available. But uh, through the use of courts, and uh, this is prevented. So essentially you have this uh, personnel uh, who were taken hostage uh, like 20 years before. They start pressing charges against the Iranian government and the like, US courts basically uh, giving them a feel to say that okay, this is the reason we still keep the assets frozen. And uh, then comes Mr. Ahmadinejad uh, into the power and uh, Yes. Question. Why did APAC, why was there opposition to this process of liberalization and opening up? APAC, you said, was against that. Well, you have this, uh, Iran is uh, from 79, okay. A major uh, grievance of the revolution was a close relationship between uh, the Shah and uh, the Israelis. So after the revolution, you have all these uh, the, uh, groups um, that agree on this one point. And it is like a, uh, the stance, the Iranian government stance on uh, the Palestine issue. It's uh, not. It's not opposed by the majority of the people. You have the certain sectional interest, especially outside U.S. Uh, that were the people who left after the revolution, who is who are basically very much uh, aligned with the Israel uh, lobby. But at the same time, you have it's it's a secondary issue right now. But at the same time, um, the 1948 re uh, ejection of Palestinians from their land is very much uh, uh, recognized as being illegitimate in Iran by a great portion of the population. But at the same time, that doesn't this Ahmadinejad. He goes to after his election, the first year of his. Uh, presidency, he goes to a conference which is titled A World Without Zionism. And during it is during this um, uh, conference that he essentially says that um, uh, according to Imam, which is Khomeini, according to Imam, um, we we need uh, we hope for uh, we hope for Israel to be wiped off the um, uh, pages of time, not from the map. 
but this is taken on and is made in like essentially like uh, I don't know if anybody knows this two days ago uh, Netanyahu made a comment about Lebanon he said that uh, when we're done with them you would not find Lebanon on the map it is a it is a rhetorical uh, I, I I would say actually like the Netanyahu's is more aggressive because it's actually he refers to the actual map. This was actually in the interview in Switzerland with the German news uh, newspaper Die, uh, Die Zeit, and it was reported by Pravda. So Pravda might be a little bit iffy. Sometimes they make up stuff, but I, it seems it is real because it was on all the blogs. So. Uh, it is a rhetorical uh, stance, it, it is a rhetorical uh, uh, utterance, but it gets to the basics that Iran doesn't recognize Israel as being legitimately constructed because of the rejection of the Palestinians from their land and um, so that's that. Any questions from up to now? Okay. I think I'm done. I talked a lot. Thank you, John. I have a question. Yes. Why is Rav San Johnny considered to be moderate? I mean, the anecdotes telling me that he is definitely not a moderate, but he's considered to be a moderate. Why? Because he wants to open up the country for business. He's the person who proposes, uh, had this idea of free trade zones where laws don't, uh, like, you have these free trade areas that laws don't apply. It, like, in some countries that are started on the, an Islamic uh, Republican, uh, uh, like Islamic Republic was essentially propagate, uh, propagating the first 15 years, we are for the masses, we are for the downtrodden, we are going to educate them, and they did a lot of, lot of that. But at the same time right now there is that tendency that wants to basically go back to the normal business, open up, uh, and so the, the way they do it is like they don't open the whole uh, country, they open up certain areas, geographical areas. They say the laws, labor laws, environmental laws don't apply over here. Iran doesn't have that much of environmental uh, regulation to begin with. And uh, the labor laws that are enforced um, are like you right now you see some uh, uh, labor activism basically the most an successful anti-government tendency right now is actually labor again in Khuzestan area in Mashar they basically went on strike they demanded a uh, uh, $130 pay increase equivalent which is um, they demanded that they they cannot be fired on the spot they agreed to that they did this two-year labor um, action which at the same time, if you look at the liberal uh, uh, action against the government, the green movement, they have not been successful to get any of their demands met. But you see the labor basically solidar like very, very um, um, small in terms of geographical area, but very significant because in Iran, the government, like everywhere else, the government and business are in, like, uh, are in cahoots. So you have this uh, uneducated people who the mm, liberal elites very much looked down upon as being uh, followers standing up and actually doing uh, very effective anti-management uh, uh, and anti-government. They, the, they got the right not to pay taxes. These workers that went on strike, they got the right not to pay taxes. Like, this is the best thing you can do. <laughs> That's the last right we're going to win in America. Yeah, but... The, the, you see what that is? Yeah. Yes. Do you have a sense of how the Arab Spring has affected... Oh, do you break my heart, man. <laughs> no, like, uh, Arab Spring, like, I have to say this, like, uh... uh Arab Spring, when the uh, Arab Spring happened, and we were, people were excited. There were demonstrations called the, the continuation of the Green Movement, and they called for demonstration. But uh, this invasion of Libya, like I was on my way to Iran, and then the invasion of Libya happened, and I'm like, damn, nothing is going to happen because people don't want to get their country invaded. You know, they want to do their history themselves. They want to be active makers of their own history. So when the invasion of Li Libya happened, when the Libya invasion happened, it was like, no, and it went dead. Like it basically, the most effective thing uh, the opposition has done 
is this the green movement uh, and its uh, affiliation called for, uh, called for a boycott of the parliamentary election which happened on Friday but their candidates were not even allowed to it's like basically not being invited to a party and saying okay I'm not going like that's the effective action that they the action they did in comparison to the labor that like they're not coming up with the, the um, they're not standing up against the government the labor they just want to get their own rights and so yeah yes so um are there any like with the last teaching we talked about co-ops were, were there any co-ops or successful stories after the revolution, because in part because of the rationing, they were very effectively the uh, very effective. Uh, we call it Taoist, um, like collectives.